Good morning to everyone. I am very happy, proud to meet you again here. You have not come to the, uh, I mean, uh, the next semester. There will be a good interact on marine internal combustion engines. The second uh, chapter which deals with fuel injection system. Now, the earlier marine internal combustion engine one, in that subject, we dealt with the components of the engine. How in a two-stroke engine, the piston, the piston rod with the cross head, the connecting rod and the crankshaft that it's connected to, and the crankshaft that is connected to the propeller shaft with the propeller in the extreme end, we have just seen the parts. Now here, how are we going to start, I mean, get the fuel admitted inside the cylinder? Is there any requirements that you have to meet? Because a life example I would like to tell you, morning breakfast everyone had, and we are all here sitting, uh, you know, you are all sitting here with a good, decent breakfast. What you need, you had in the morning, not beyond, not less, so that the energy is developed within your system, which keeps you brisk and smart until the lunch time. The similar one here, this fuel has to be admitted inside the cylinder at the right time with the right quantity and also take care of the pressure in the cylinder not to rise beyond its limit as it is rightly put up here the basic requirements four basic requirements that you have to follow this is very simple for a marine engineer to be a full-fledged marine engineer if you keep these four points in your mind and operate the engine, then you have no problems at all in ownership with regards to your engine. But if you deviate in maintaining these, then you land up with problems like scavenge fire, that is scavenge and business fire, the crankcase explosions and so on. So let's go one by one. It must be, the first point says, it must be metered accurately the fuel to be delivered in each cylinder. What do you mean by meter? Meter means measuring. Like how you had your breakfast, by counting two weeklies or one dosa. You had a count and you metered it. You felt when you stop, said, yeah, it's enough. You stop in that. So you metered it. Without the metering system, if you would have had more than enough it leaves for your breakfast, whatever it is, then you know you are going to land up in stomach upsets. The similar one, metering is very, very important in this fuel injection system. Measure. I can give you an example, a life example is 165 grams per bhp per hour. That is 165 grams of fuel to develop 1 bhp per hour is required. Now, for whatever, if the engine, I mean, for example, if the engine RPM is uh, 100 RPM for one hour, how many revolutions this fellow would have uh, uh, rotated? You know. Now, divide, you have to divide this 165 by this number of revolutions into number of minutes then you will get to know that it's a very, very small quantity. In grams, it is a very small quantity. Now that small quantity has to be admitted in the right time. Since the quantity of the fuel delivered per cylinder is, uh, I mean, per cylinder is small, the slight inaccuracy will show itself prominently as a large error. Now, for example, 165 grams, if I divide it, maybe I get 0.12, I mean 0.012 grams. I have to deliver. If I just increase the quantity and deliver it, then definitely 
the cylinder pressure, the temperatures, everything will start raising high power above the limit. There is a limit. It was the second point is it, it was otherwise the fuel and distributed throughout the combustion chamber. Now we know in the uh, design of this engine how the combustion chamber is. The piston is round, which is moving up and down, nicely sealed on to the line arm, forming a good airtight seal. The piston rings take care of it, and you have a cylinder head on top. Where you have the exhaust valve, the air static valve, the fuel injector valve, and so on. The mountings are there, which forms a combustion chamber. The line arm, the piston crown, the cylinder head forms a combustion chamber. Now, in this combustion chamber, you have to output that small quantity of fuel right through the cylinder, not just focusing on one point. Just, you know, it's like only about just uh, pouring a teaspoon of uh, uh, honey or so. No, 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 no. It is not like that. You have to split it and distribute it through all the combustion chamber springs. That's taken care of by optimization, which we will be dealing in the next coming uh, lessons of a fuel injector. Here we will be dealing with uh, the optimization of the fuel and its distribution methods. The third point. It must be admitted at most desirable point in the cycle. The admission should be regulated in relation to combustion so that the pressure rate is limited. Now, the fuel must be admitted at the most desirable point in this cycle. We have seen what is a cycle in a four stroke engine. It is the suction stroke, then compression stroke. Combustion stroke and exhaust stroke. The similar manner in a two stroke engine, it is the same suction, compression, combustion, and exhaust. Now, when to admit this fuel during the combustion stroke, or during the combustion stroke, or during the suction stroke, or during the exhaust stroke? This is where you have to be very careful. You have to admit the fuel. During the combustion stroke, that is the end of compression, where the air, the piston has traveled down, compressed the air and raised the temperature from 45 degrees centigrade to 450 degrees centigrade. The air temperature has gone from 45 to 450 just by compressing the air. Now, why I specify this 450 degrees centigrade temperature release? That is the spontaneous ignition temperature of the fuel. The air in the combustion chamber must reach the spontaneous ignition temperature of the fuel. Only then the fuel what you admit in or we call it as inject inside the combustion chamber will spontaneously ignite. Will spontaneously ignite. Once the spontaneous ignition takes place, then you know a good amount of heat is generated. This 450 degree centigrade will raise up to 1650 degree centigrade for a, a very short moment, which has exceeded the melting point of aluminium, lead, gas steel. And cast iron, but none of the components are melting. None of the components are melting. All are intact. How is it possible? When we have raised the temperature, now the temperature from 450, after injecting the fuel, which is burned by itself, self ignition has taken place, the temperature has gone up to 1650 degrees centigrade, and the pressure, which was around approximately 45, uh, kg per centimeter square is gone up to 90 kg per centimeter square. None of the components have melted, though the melting points of lead, aluminium, cast iron, and cast steel has exceeded. It has exceeded that temperature. It is because, purely because, it is 
It's only for a very small duration of time. In the tiny diagram, I will tell you when do you inject the fuel just little before TDC to little after TDC. That may be before TDC to do, to treat it based after TDC. This is where you inject, uh, this is the time when you inject the fuel. So now, it's a very short period. In the, uh, 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 in the RPM it does, from 110 RPM when it review, uh, when it does, the propeller shaft is running at 110 RPM, this duration time fraction is very less. So, also added by the cooling water, the jacket cooling water enters at a temperature of 75 degrees centigrade and exceeds after heat exchange, it exceeds at 85 degrees centigrade. So, the temperature is maintained within the combustion chamber, also not exceeding beyond the any melting points it is taken care of. Now, coming to the last point. The admission of fuel should be terminated prominently and the pressure before the nozzle decayed to avoid dribbling of the injector. Now, this is an important one. As it is all the four points you have to keep it in mind. And the entire fuel injection system works with this four points guidance. The last one is termination. I said the fuel must start injecting 10 degrees before TDC and it should just pause TDC and stop at 15 degrees TDC. It must stop at 15 degrees TDC. This is termination is very important. Beginning is important and termination is also important. If you don't terminate the fuel at this given 15 degrees I mean, uh, uh, after TDC, it can lead to after burning. The remaining part of the fuel, which remains still in the fuel injector, may dribble later, dribble into the combustion chamber later as the piston starts moving down with the pressure which is developed, which will lead to after burning. That should not happen. So, today we uh, I mean, um, it's, uh, we have learned how these four points play a major role in the fuel system. Let's go to the next slide. The basic types of airless or solid injection system. Now, right throughout, I, uh, I, uh, I think uh, everyone would be uh, would accept if you know the history of uh, uh, how these marine engines or the engines evolved or came into place. Right from the World War's time. During the World War's time, that was the time where a lot of research had to be done. And we have to, of course, thank the Germans a lot for, uh, you know, such a good developments which they came up with with regards to the engines. And there are four, three types of injection systems. The method in which you take the fuel, three types. Now, how can I compare it with the life example? What is this vector reserve you may ask? Now, yttrium with chutney, you can have. Yttrium with sambar, you can have. Or, you can soak this yttrium in sambar and nicely use a teaspoon and have it. There are different methods. But as it is, the yttrium has gone in, you have your core fuel which has gone inside, along with the side pieces of this tasty sambar and chutney. But in the method in which you sent it inside, first you taste it with chutney, you, then you cut your taste bud, then you determine, okay, once in four times I use chutney, or once in three times I use sambar, or I will use this idli, mix it up with idli and chutney, I mean chutney and sambar, together with that. So, the similar manner here, you have three methods. The first method is, Common rail method. The other one is called as unit injection method, and the third method is called as gas compression method. Now we are going to deal, we are going to you know go in detail how this common rail system works, how this unit injection system works, and how the gas compression system works in the next coming slides. Let's go. Here, I'm starting off with the common rail system. 
common way that itself gives you a uh, uh, you know simple explanation common way common way means something common when the fuel is going through and it waits under high pressure now this high pressure oil will be admitted to each cylinder according to its firing order there is something called firing order for each engine now it's not that if you have a six cylinder engine one first cylinder second cylinder third cylinder fourth cylinder fifth cylinder and sixth cylinder not that you have to admit all uh, i mean this fuel to all the cylinders now you have to make it uh, make the crankshaft rotate in a in a uh, in a speed in which you want the governor will come uh, with regards to the governor data. This governor takes care of that job of having a controlled uh, regulation of the speed. Yeah. So, first, what we do, we admit the fuel to only one unit. Then comes the next. It's next means I don't mean after one is two. It is one, five, three, six, two, four. Why is this so? The crankshaft. The crankshaft, which is made, as we have seen in the construction of uh, the crankshaft, it can be made in one single piece if it's a small engine. But for the engines, as we come in, it is made in uh, separate pieces and put together, put together, compressed and put together the webs, the crank pin, the connecting rod pin, and so on. They are pressed, compressed, and chronically pressed one to one and locked in. Nothing. So, this crankshaft is a heavy weight which is approximately about 100 tons weight. 100 tons. And the length, you can see, it will be around the same, maybe about 25 uh, feet long. Now, there is a very good possibility that the crankshaft may sag. The sagging and hogging can take place if you don't admit the fuel at, according to the firing order to balance and keep the crankshaft in line. In line. Yes. Now, coming to as per the diagram of uh, this common grid system, we can see in this diagram you have a fuel priming pump. This pump takes suction from the common line and pumps the oil to the fuel pump. Here you have a positive displacement pump, two pumps on either side, pumps to a common manifold here, pumps to a common manifold. From the common manifold, the oil travels to the accumulator. Now, before it travels to the accumulator, you can see a branch here calling, uh, it's called as the spill pump, and it's also called as uh, the, uh, the branch here of it is called as the emergency spill pump, where this fill pump is operated by the compressed air system. The valve opening and closing is controlled by this compressed air. Now, when do you want to admit this fuel? Only during the conversion stroke, the end of compression and beginning of conversion, you want to admit the fuel. But what about the remaining time? Remaining time, you don't need to admit the fuel. So, there is no fuel which will pass through the fuel tank valve with the fuel injector. No fuel should go past this fuel tank valve to the fuel injectors. It's a dual fuel injector provided in this system. Here, you have an accumulator cylinder. What is special about the accumulator cylinder? It maintains a pressure between 400 to 500 atmospheric pressures. It maintains the line pressure, the line pressure is maintained between 400 to 500 atmospheric pressures. Why it has to maintain? Watch the diagram very carefully. It is now not only going to one fuel tiny bump here, it is also branching to the second unit. Now there are many more branches, third unit. 4th unit, 5th unit, 6th unit. I did say, you have, using the 
the fuel timing valve, following the four regulations what we saw on the previous slide, the fuel has to be admitted inside the cylinder. Now, when this fuel timing valve operates, the, the, the cam assembly is inside, which we will be seeing in the next uh, diagram, which admits the fuel to the fuel detector, there will be a pressure drop. There will be a line pressure drop. Now, which line pressure is talking about? He's talking about this line pressure, this line pressure. There will be a, a drop in pressure. Now, if there is a drop in pressure, the first unit, you admit it between 400 to 500 atmospheric pressures of fuel. What about as per the firing order? One, five. When you come to the unit number five, if you don't have that accumulator cylinder, you will land up in having a lesser pressure in this common line and the admitting of the fuel will be, quantity of the fuel admitted in the cylinder will be less. Now, just recollect what was the very first point of the basic fuel requirement? Quantity of the fuel should be measured to be metered and it has to be given in accurate measure. When the first unit gets about 0.1 gram, how can you feed the second unit 0 0.05 grams? No. You have to feed the same 0.1. No. Just approximately closer to that. Not exactly the same, a little closer to that. Those uh, you know, fine tunings later in the fuel pump uh, detail study, then we can study on. But the same 0 0.1 grams of oil that you have written in number one unit, the same quantity you have written number five unit, one, five, three, six, two, four, as per the firing order. So that this accumulator, which is filled with the nitrogen, takes up the shock and maintains the pressure between 452, 400 to 500 atmospheric pressures. Now, here uh, there are two fuel injectors because this is a top sword engine, a post piston engine. Of course, nowadays we don't have a post piston engine. The latest developments are uh, uniflow system and uh, uh, unit injection system, I'm sorry, a single piston uh, type. So we don't have this uh, top sword. Uh, method any further, but uh, in our know, latest times we will see on that. Here, you may be wondering, you may ask me, sir, is this mechanism still available, like having two fuel, uh, I mean, uh, many fuel pumps, and then it's going to a uh, uh, you know common block, having a spill arrangement, and having this accumulator cylinder, then from the accumulator cylinder going to the timing valve, and the fuel, then going to the fuel injector. The latest developments is this. Very simple. All electronics. The entire the timing valve is removed and it is taken care of by a one single unit called electronics control system unit. Here, the fuel which is entering at high pressure from the booster pump, which is entering on uh, the uh, I mean, fuel supply through the throttle valve, when it enters, it is boosted by the high pressure uh, the supply pump and the high pressure supply pump pumps makes the oil to remain in this manifold. It makes it to remain in this manifold. Now, there is a pressure sensor, you can see that, the blue line. It gives a signal to the electronics control system. Not only that, now just watch this. You have a crank angle sensor. At what angle is this crank shaft? Like for example, number one unit. What angle it is? Is it exactly 10 degrees before TDC? Or 8 degrees before TDC? Or 12 degrees before TDC? This is very uh, well measured by electronic sensing system. A nano level. Nowadays we have started functioning on uh, you know activities in a micro nano level. Micro nano level, nano level tuning of the speed injection system, which gives a signal to the electronics control system when the 
this number one unit is and what angle it is. It gives a continuous field. Now, this field, the grand angle sensor field, the pressure field, both are taken into consideration and also the load on the engine. Maybe it's a bad weather or it's a loaded condition. The ship is fully loaded with cargo. Now it needs an enormous amount of thrust to push this car forward. Now that signal is also fed to this electronics control system. With all these three feedbacks, the electronics control system gives a command to the individual fuel injectors. It gives a command to the individual fuel injectors to open and close. Okay, when to open, when to close, and also make sure that the quantity of oil entering into the cylinder as per the firing order. Mind it, as per the firing order. Why I say again the firing order is crankshaft is only weak. You cannot just fire number one unit and then go for number two. Bending stresses will take place and it will shear off. So you have to balance the load. You have to balance the load. One, five, three, six, two, four. By this balancing, the crankshaft is taken care of and your fuel is also injected into the cylinder very precisely in micro nano level. It is injected. Here, I've got a, a detailed explanation. Here, of course, the same thing I've just uh, explained here. Uh, with the CRIS, the high pressure pump value is the fuel to the common grain, which uh, is common to all cylinders. Yes, this is common to all cylinders. Each injector is accomplished in sequence by the ECU means electronic control system. This electronic control system plays a part. That is why you would have seen nowadays we are recruiting an electronics officer on board a ship. And in a minute, you very well know that we have a very special course for those who do BE, uh, BE Tripoli. BE Tripoli, we are doing. Tripoli, Marek, we are doing. They have to do a six months of ETO course. And there you learn more electronics to deal with. And how to do the fine tuning so that you can get maximum output. The firm, this is what the owner wants. The owner thinks about see, he has provided 10,000 metric tons of uh, bunker oil for a long voyage. Now, you have used to maybe 6,000 metric tons of oil you used for this entire voyage, of voyage from Australia to New Orleans, maybe about 25 days. He says for the 6,000 metric tons of consumption, the power, what it should have generated and converted into the distance traveled, you should give him uh, you know, a better you know, economics, not consuming more fuel for a, a you know, shorter distance. Can that happen? Yes, it can happen. In Rome, in our uh, main highways, you can see some trucks exhibiting a lot of you know, carbon, you know, exhaust. That means unburned fuel. You know, some you know unburned fuel is getting very fuel is getting wasted. It's lost. It's losing its energy there, going on waste. So this wasting should be totally avoided by this electronic system. We get the best out of the fuel what is given to us and keep everybody happy, the owner happy, the charter is happy and we are also happy. How we are happy? Our commercial system, the unit, the, the liner, the piston crown, the under piston space, all these place remains carbon free. All I can say, very less carbon, very less carbon. You know, the good old days when uh, in the 80s, uh, I joined shipping as a fifth engineer and I could see every thousand hours we used to clean the animal space, not every thousand, it's only five hours. Every five hundred hours we used to clean the animal space and a lot of used to be there. Unburned fuels, the oil and all these things. But nowadays, even after a period of thousand two hundred hours of the uh, range running, 
the underpistol space looks blankly. How is it possible? Why the electronic system feeling the oil at the right fuel oil at the right time at the right required period and getting the best out of it? Next, sir. Next. Yes. Now, sir, the third generation common rail system, then you saw just a line diagram, but here you can see the actual appearance, how it will look, how is that high pressure pump looking at? Yes, here you can see a high pressure fuel pump, then the next one is distributed unit, then the high pressure sensor, very distributed, number four uh, is the fuel line, and number five is the uh, you know, common rail fuel rate, and uh, number six is the individual fuel injectors. These are all the individual fuel injectors. These are all the individual fuel injectors. And number seven, you have the pressure accumulator which maintains the pressure. With this, I conclude for the day. I'm very happy you have been very patient. And now I would like to give you an opportunity now. Please come up with questions. If you have any doubts, yes, I'm here to answer your questions. And this is the core. It's similar to that of your heart. It's similar to that of your heart. Don't uh, just nod your head saying, yeah, yeah, I understood. Tomorrow we will see all that. Let me ask the uh, professor later. No, no. You come up with their questions. I will be so happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Good day.